Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming back to the Citrine Path. Um, today, again, we have myself, Amber, and my amazing co-host. And I'm Patsy from Violet Elements. Before we get started here, we just want to share real quick that this is our journeys and our guest journey on their spiritual life and their herbal life. So everything we talk about here, we do recommend you do your own research and definitely talk to your provider before you start any herbal remedies or home remedies. Hi, hey everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Citrine Path. Um, so today we're going to be talking about mediums, I think is what they're called. Um, funny old sayings and what they really mean and where they came from. This was kind of an interesting... Uh, topic you had us look up your mom i just thought it was funny because um i heard somebody talk about eating a frog i was like oh that's super funny like i hadn't heard anybody say it but then there was a conversation between the two people that were talking about it and they were talking about how they thought it meant one thing they both were disagreeing on basically and so they looked it up and come to find out it has to do with doing something you don't want to do like just bite the bullet and get it done type thing so it's kind of like the same the same saying so i thought it was funny that is funny. yeah i've never heard of this the frog either hmm. yeah so now they say it all the time they're like oh i gotta go eat the frog like it's really funny that is super funny um i look some up too so i've always heard the saying like it's raining cats and dogs so mm -hmm. when you um like brought up this idea i thought to look up raining cats and dogs but like i wanted to look up where it came from and why people said it. like why it started in the first place um, so from what I found out, it seems like nobody really knows where it came from or why it started. But one theory um said that so okay, so Odin, the god of storms, is often shown uh, with dogs either by his side, and cats come from the general theory that witches often ride their broomsticks in heavy rain and they're closely connected with cats. So put those together, you have the heavy wind of Odin and the witch's brain. So it's like, it's an evil, crazy storm outside. That's funny. So then it'd be raining cats and dogs. Yeah. Yeah. Who knows how true So I found, right? Because I heard somebody else say, talk about that. And I thought they said it was because the cats would hide in the rafters of barns like when it was a bad storm to like get away from something and then they would fall i don't know your story sounds much more funner yeah i also um, seen that I have... when... oh go ahead you're good no 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 what what oh um i also seen that somebody said that when they still had the old traditional thatched roofs uh, animals and stuff would hide up in there. Mm. So when it rained, like the cats and dogs would fall out of the thatch roofing. That's funny. But have you ever seen them re roof one of those roofs? Oh, yeah. I watch a guy on Instagram do it. It's pretty interesting. Yeah. It's freaking crazy. And they do it so fast. Yeah. Um, so. I'm sure you have. So dad had never heard of a white elephant party. Yeah. And okay. he didn't understand like what it was. He's like, I've never heard of that. He's like, why are you calling it that? I've heard of gift exchange. Never heard him call it a white elephant party. So I looked it up. So a white elephant were once considered highly scarce creatures in Thailand. The animal even is, is on their, their national flag until 1917. But they were also wheeled as a 
subtitle form of punishment. So according to the legend, if it was underlining or a royal, sorry for my pronunciations of words again, um, argument against the king, the royal might present the unfortunate man with a gift of a white elephant uh, yeah so so basically he would like give them the token of it it would cause financial ruin but it didn't really say why but maybe because people didn't want to like associate with them because you know it was a punishment but yeah i thought that was really funny so it was something that was rare that you're like given and like stuck with so that's kind of funny that people have white elephant parties because you're that just is, like given a gift. That is super funny. I didn't know that there yeah. was actually a story behind it. And like, please me. Now you know. Now you know. Okay. Uh, so one that I looked up was happy as a clam, right? Mm. So happy as a clam is actually a shortened version of the actual saying. It's supposed to be um, happy as a clam in high water. Oh. So clams is the idea of why it got made. Clams can only be dug in low tide. So when the tide is high, they're happy and they can't be plucked. Um, it, I figured out the first time it was used was in 1833. It was done by two guys the same year. Um, the first citation was The Harpy's Head, A Legend of Kentucky by James Hall. And then Atkins Casket by Samuel C. Atkin. Um, and by accident, they both happened to be published in Philadelphia, which I thought was interesting. Hmm. Happy as a climb on high tide. That's interesting. <laughs> okay have you ever heard of i'm sure, sure you have but crocodile tears like what crying those crocodile tears yeah okay so <laughs> in modern english the phrase is used to describe a display of superficial or false sorrow so somebody like pretending they're really upset or pretending they're really hurt to get like attention so that's they're crying crocodile tears oh that makes uh, so much um, more sense but it actually isn't it funny but wait it gets it gets better okay so um the saying actually goes back to medieval beliefs that crocodiles shed tears as sadness why they killed and consumed their prayer prey Goodness, it's apparently coffee time. Okay, so the myth dates back as far as the 14th century, and it comes from a book called The Travels of Sir John Madville, a widely popular upon its release, uh, but it has like recounts of a brave knight's adventure. And during his supposed travels through Asia, among other many fabulous areas, the book described a crocodile um, that he like wept as he ate his food and has no tongue. So for some reason that was like really surprising to the guy, I guess. Um, but yeah. But then yeah. Shakespeare ended up using it in one of his his writings um and then that's what it has turned into today like it's from how shakespeare used it in his play in the 16th century kind of changed and then it evolved into what we call it now we yeah that's so funny though i didn't that i didn't even know that that thing was so old that's really cool Right? And who knows? There probably like probably was more to it, kinda like the happy as a clam. You know, I wonder if there's like more to it originally. But yeah, 
thought it was really funny. That was super funny. So, um, I wrote another one. So, proof is in the pudding. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. So, um, it's also short for something too. So the whole long version is the proof of the proof of the pudding is in the eating or tasting. Mm. The long one. So it says the value, quality, or truth of something must be judged based on the direct experience with what you're talking about. Um, so it apparently, from what I've read, this has been found to be used since the 1300s, but became popular by Miguel. I don't know. I'll put him up on the screen. I have no idea how to say his name. Um, in 1605, it became popular. Okay, say this thing again, the whole one. The proof of the pudding is in the tasting. That's funny. Makes more sense. Mm -hmm. I have a couple, but after that one, I had to find one that's... Well, no, I'll just read this one. So... <laughs> the die hard so it typically refers to somebody that has a particular set of beliefs so like the term die hard originally had a much um like literal term oh. so <laughs> it's, the, it's kind of morbid but um, it was the one that I was most, I was like, oh, interesting. I would have thought, like, it makes sense, but I didn't think that. Um, so originally had a series of meanings, but the earliest incantation was in the 1700s. And it had to do with the expression that described a, <laughs> a man who struggled the longest during an execution by hanging. Oh, man. So he was, <laughs> instead of, like, had a hard time dying or took a long time to die, he was called Die Hard. Die. Yeah. So the, the phrase later became even more popular in 1811 during the battle. I can't pronounce that word. I'm sorry. But um, during the. Napoleonic War. Um, by a British officer. Started using it towards his unit to stand their ground and die hard. Making the enemies pray, pay dearly for each of us. So he turned it around the other way. And... Like, fight, stay hard, die hard. So then it, it kind of changed to a little bit more what we use it today. But yeah, I thought that was funny originally. It's how they classified how long the person took to die when hanging. That's crazy. That, like, makes me think of football fans. You know, because they always say, oh, yeah, I'm a die hard whatever team. That just feeds your heart to put out of your own misery. <laughs> right. Like, well, it's funny because you, you, that's, yeah. But it's funny because you'll hear people like, I have nothing against the Cowboys, but you'll he'll hear people usually say like, oh, I'm a diehard Cowboys fan no matter what. Like, but it still kind of makes sense. You just can't be put out of your own misery. So maybe... <laughs> Pick a different idiom, there, guys. That doesn't sound the best now that we know the truth of what that really means. That's funny. right. Isn't that funny? So I looked up fit as a fit as a fiddle, right? Fit as a fiddle. Okay. Fit as a fiddle, and it means like proper, put together, like to perfection kind of a thing. But um, they think it got started because when you play a fiddle. Um, like you have to hold it just right and you have to like move your bow just right and because there's no frets on um, 
the fiddle neck that you have to like be really finesse the fiddle and know exactly where you need to put your hands and exactly know how to play it you have to be like they said they described it as like a dance you have to have like a dance with the fiddle and have to be perfect with it so i think that's maybe why it got started interesting that hmm. is a fiddle you have to have your shit together I don't know. Definitely, definitely not me this morning. I have too much crafty stuff all over my my space. I forgot that it was still messy. That's all right. That's just okay. My life. Yeah. <laughs> um, I got another one. Okay, so resting on your laurels. Okay. Okay, so originally, it had to do with the ancient Greece and the, like, I don't know the official name for it, but, like, the gladiator games. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so when the athletes would win, they weren't, you know, because of the whole, most of them were slaves and all that fun stuff. Um, they were given a a wreath made out of laurel branches, and that was placed on top of their head. So then they were like temporarily awarded as the winner, and so they like kind of got like a break, sort of, and got to like sit out because they were like the big winner. Um. So then that became resting on your loyals kind of evolved from that. So that's what it originally was. So they would make it, give it to them, they would win. And then they got a break from fighting because they were the winners. Um, But later, the Romans adopted this practice and presented wreaths to their generals who won important battles. Um, and I cannot pronounce that word, but there, there was a term that they would give the Roman and the Greece. It's like lower rates, lower rates. Um, so then that turned in and translated. Eventually people started calling it resting on your laurels. Um, and then it was something that was like given to as a reward to like everybody so it wasn't just the greek athletes anymore so like anytime anybody did anything or like like this was talking about won a war or got a promotion or accomplished something that's what they would give them and then they would say oh now you get a rest on your laurels because you made it to your accomplishment you hit that that's really interesting. I think it's super neat looking at these and realizing like how much history they have and where they came from. Yeah, because I had no idea on that one. But I just thought it was interesting that it ended up being such a not valuable thing, but like something that was like praised, you know, but now most people kind of look at it as it like like lazy you know like if you're resting on your loyals you're not you're not doing anything so it's just funny how it changes and evolves yeah that is funny you're right so you got another one no you take better notes than i did this week (laughs) that doesn't happen very often okay i got a couple more Uh, So, paint the town red. Okay. Okay, it has to do with uh, a night of drunkenness. So, 1837, uh, there was a group of friends out of night drinking through an English town. And 
they like knocked so like imagine this they're like going through the town they're drunk they're like knocking over flower pots pulling door knockers um breaking when you know just causing havoc right being hooligans yeah there you go being hooligans um through the town okay um so it says that the mob literally painted a toll gate and several other homes with red paint being mischief you know causing dra- causing damage um including what i'd already said breaking windows flower pots um so because they were painting the paint that they had found was red um when the night was done and the authorities was alerted to what was going on um they said that they were painting the town red and going through causing mischief and being hooligans and that's how the phrase originally stuck so they were literally painting the town red that's funny yeah but that's also how um the the word slang of red light district came to too because like if you think about it you know like the area that they were doing it in was like bars and that kind of businesses so then you have a bunch of drunken people and who knows maybe some street workers and some homeless people and you know just like imagine that whole thing and so then that those areas started becoming called the red light district because that's where all the hooligans go and cause mischief and trouble that's crazy okay that makes a lot of sense isn't it funny that is funny how about running amok okay yeah I heard that one. Okay. So commonly it's described as wild or erratic behavior. But originally it was a a medical term. It became popular in the 18th and 19th century when European visitors um, learned of a particular medical issue. That caused otherwise normal tribesmen to go like berserk or seemingly randomly killed on sprees. So like they would like randomly just just go crazy. Like they had unusual behavior. They would go on random killing sprees. And so they would call it they were going a monk. Oh. And then it, it kind of evolved from there. Um, in 1772, a former explorer, Captain James Cook, noted that to run amok is to sally forth from the house and kill the person or persons supposed to have injured the amok and other persons that attempted to intervene in his passage so basically they thought it was like they were wronged and they were fixing the wrong so if somebody was running amok they were taking revenge and killing the people that wronged them but yeah that's so crazy And it says that at one point it was noted that people that, so onlookers, when somebody was running amok, they thought they were possessed by evil spirits. Um, But a lot of them found that later they had a psycho, me and my words, I'm so sorry. Psychological? Yes, there you go. 
um, issue that was undiagnosed, but today would be considered a mental condition. So basically, they snapped. Psychotic. Right. Yeah. But isn't that funny that it was these tribesmen and, you know, 18th, 19th century that snapped and went crazy and so people would call them they were running amok oh yes the running amok yeah that's crazy that they that was like this an actual medical condition right really interesting and now people say running amok as if they're, they're just really busy yeah but if you kind of think about it it kind of has a little bit of true to it too because if they're running amok usually they're like oh yeah i was so crazy and busy today i had so much going on i was running amok like that's true yeah kind of like wild untamed you know crazy yeah just funny okay so i have another one for you what? i think i have one more after this one off the okay so the third degree Oh, I don't know if I've heard of that one. Like, I got the third degree, or they gave me the third degree. Okay. Um, but it goes back to, like, the Freemasons. So the third degree burns was described as a questioning style. So basically they would, like, rapidly give them questions and like interrogate them so they were getting the third degree burn and and look of the truth uh, but it was originated from the Freemasons and it had to do with the members undergoing questioning and examinations before they could come to the third degree member or a master mason Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. I thought that was funny because I had no idea on that one. Like, I've heard people say, like, oh, my gosh, I got the third degree for my, you know. But, yeah, yeah I thought I just, it was really funny. That is super interesting. Yeah. Like, so on the article, it also had talked about how um, they thought it originally he came from like the third degree murder third degree like it was like a a level of a criminal code mm. um but then they actually found it back all the way back with the freemasons and you had to go through an examination to become a third degree member make sure you're not hiding nothing yeah right some of that Freemason stuff is very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So I do know only from watching uh, uh, the show Oak Island that the Freemasons was an off branch of the um, the Templars, which I thought was, I didn't know that. And I don't know how true that is. It just said that in the show. But I didn't realize that. I thought that was funny. That is interesting. Yeah, there was a show, I think I was yeah. watching it on uh, Netflix for a little while. And it was like these people like kind of broke into Freemason's like group and they were recording it. And they Ooh. Put- and they put it on Netflix. I don't remember what it's called. It's, I think it's been like two or three years since I started. I was watching it. But yeah, it's pretty crazy. Like, um, I've heard from some shows that they have to like when before you can become like a, a third degree Mason member. I guess now that we know, they literally have to like get this close to a skeleton and like stare death in the face to not be scared of it. Anymore. Yeah, I know, like, I don't know a lot about them, uh, but the little that I do know, I know originally they are, it's rumored 
to do a lot of like ritual type stuff and sacrifices and bodies and I've seen a couple shows where they've like renovated old places that used to be used by the Freemasons and they like found bones and skeletons and such but it was so long ago like who knows where it really came from and like what the story behind was or if they like if it was somebody that they had used in a ritual or if they had like donated their body to be buried there like I don't know and they're so like secretly hush hush you know the whole secret is like oh that could be one that we could look up yeah. secret societies could be interesting but if they're secret then yeah. how are we going to find out information <laughs> That's true, Amber. That's true. I don't know. I gotta at least like, wait until my babies are grown to go see your agent and take a break. Yeah. <laughs> Going all incognito. Yeah. I remember we only got a couple more minutes left. So you have any last thoughts? Anything else you want to add or say or throw in? Mm, I don't think so. But that was fun. Like, I didn't realize that a lot of the sayings, like, ha- like I liked the history. Of, like, I was, I was surprised. Like, because I, I thought I would just find, like, short little blurps about, like, what it really meant. Um, but it was kind of cool going back and, like, most of them had, like, a history to it of, like, it started off this, but evolved to this, and this is what they originally used it for. Um, and most of them, surprisingly, had to do with like publications. So most of them were like in a book or like the Die Hard one. Like it was used to describe how long it took them, you know. So they either had to like probably wrote it down or put it in a report, you know, the documentation of the hanging. So I just thought it was funny that most of them had to do with it being written in a book. Yeah, I think that's super interesting. And I love that, like, the crocodile tears is from the medieval times. Like, I had no idea that it was that old. And, like, proof is in the pudding. I never would have imagined it was from the 1300s. But I think it's interesting that even from that long, it's still in our culture today. It's really fascinating. Yeah. Very true. Yeah, or that happy as a clam was only, like, part of it. But that just goes to show, like, the whole telephone game again. Like, how it, parts of it gets dropped off or changes. And then, of course, the meaning changes. I mean, I guess if most people say they're happy as a clam, I would always, like, think of it as being, like, content you know like happy as a bug in a rug you know mm-hmm. no all right everybody i just want to say thank you guys for joining us this week i hope you enjoyed listening to our history of idioms with us um and if this is something else you guys want to listen to in the future let us know down below um and make sure you guys are liking the video for us it helps us out in the youtube algorithm and Go ahead and give us a sub- subscribe so that you know when we post every week. Until next time, we will see you all later. Remember, we do not treat, cure, or diagnose any illness. So if you have any questions about anything we talked about today, please reach out to your provider. So we are always so honored and blessed that you spent your time with us. And we can't wait to visit with you next time. So please. Come back and visit us, but until then, go forth with love and intention.